means what I don't know is T2. This is my unknown, okay? So remember, it's usually in like the very, the, the second part of the sentence or the information, find the what, okay? And that's your unknown. So you're identifying, first identify what formula you're going to use by looking at what units are in the problem. If it was volume and pressure, then you know you use Boyle's Law. But if it's volume and temperature, then I know I'm going to use Charles's law. So that tells you what the formula is. Identify what each of those units are in the problem. Now, I've got to get T2 all by itself. So here sometimes becomes a challenge. So V1 over T1 is V2 over T2. Well, actually, the first thing that I would do before I even start the rearranging is to do what with temperature? Mm -hmm. I've got to... I've got to convert to Kelvin. So when you do Charles's law, remember that you're going to add 273 to any Celsius number, and that's going to tell you your Kelvin value. So 27.3 plus 273 is 300.3 Kelvin. So that really should be the very first step. After you identify what the formula is, Identify what your three knowns are. Identify what your unknown is. Now, I've got to get T2. So if you look at the formula, do you notice that T2 is in the denominator? So this always flips people, okay? This always ends up causing an issue because it's difficult to get T2 all by itself in one step. So it's not just a matter of multiplying both sides or dividing both sides by something because T2 is in the denominator. I've got to get T2 in the nominator and then isolate it. So what is one way that you could do that? So you've got to think about your algebra. If you've got to get something in the denominator, in the nominator, what can you do? Say it a little bit louder. <laughs> Okay, so if you multiply both sides by T2, that'd move it, right? So now it's in the denominator. So am I done? Then you're going to have to, I'm going to have to move T1 and I'm going to have to move V1. So to move T1, what would I have to do? Multiply both sides times T1. Multiply times T1, multiply times T1. Do you see that that will cancel? So now on the left, I have T2 times V1. So to move that one, what do I need to do? I'm going to have to divide both sides by V1. So if I divide by V1, divide by V1, then that would move V1 over to the other side. So I would end up with T2 is V2 times T1 divided by V1. So that seems like an awful lot of moving. Here's another way that you can do it a little bit faster. You can cross multiply. So does anybody remember how to cross multiply? So when you cross multiply, so if I take V1 over T1 is equal to V2 over T2. When I say cross multiply, that is basically multiplying the values that are on opposite sides. So this means that V1 times T2 is equal to V2 times T1. Does anybody remember doing that in algebra? Okay, so you could cross multiply, and then all I got to do is just move V1. So I'd have to move V1 because it's over here, divide both sides by V1. Do you see that I got the exact same answer, like the exact same formula? So it's a little bit easier, or I mean, I don't know, maybe you like doing all of the ones above. And then I'll tell you there's one other way, because there's any other ways you want to do it. One other way is I could actually take Charles's law and flip it. Since V1 over T1 is equal to V2 over T2, if I flip the units and put T on top and V on the bottom, they're also going to be equivalent. So I could just take and say, well, T1 over V1 is T2 over V2. Because they're still going to be equal. If they're equal this way, they're going to be equal if they are inverted. 
And in that case, all I have to do is move V2. So if you look at this one, if I multiply both sides times V2, times V2, that will cancel, moving it. Do you see that it's exactly the same? V2 times T1 divided by V1 is my answer. So these are all different ways that you can rearrange the formula. If you have a number in the denominator, you've got to make sure that you move it into the denominator. These are three different ways you can move it into the, de into the denominator. You can move each thing. Okay, you can move each of the units like what we did in the first example. You could do a cross multiply way of approaching it. So the opposite sides end up multiplied times each other. They're still equal to each other. Or you could just flip both of those units, putting the temperature on the top, volume on the bottom, and then just move to get your temperature all by itself. Any way you want to do it, you still end up with this. Like in all three of those, this is still the formula. Does everybody see that? So they're not, like you don't have to do all of these. You just have to do one, whichever one is most comfortable for you. I'm just sort of like reminding you about some of the algebra ways of moving variables around in a formula. But you've got to get T2 all by itself, irregardless. So now you can plug this in. So V2, which is 22.5 liters, times T1, which is 300.3 Kelvin, divided by V1, which is 52.5 liters. That is what I have to plug in to solve. 22.5 times 300.3 divided by 52.5. And I got 128.7. equals 128.7 Kelvin. So you see that liters and liters will, will cancel, but my answer's in Kelvin, and my question says, what will the final temperature of the gas be in Celsius? So if I know Kelvin, I know to go from Celsius to Kelvin, I've got to add 273. So to go from Kelvin to Celsius, what do I have to do? Subtract. So you're going to have to subtract 273 to put it back into degrees Celsius. One twenty-eight point seven minus. I got one hundred and forty-four point three degrees Celsius, and it's a negative number. So this is like a negative Celsius value. So in this final answer, do, can I keep four significant figures? 144.3? What do I have to round it to? So I'm going to have to round it. 27.3 is three significant figures. 22.5, three significant figures. 52.5, three significant figures. So do you see that I have three significant figures in all the numbers in the problem? So that means that I'm going to keep the one, four, and the four, but the point three ends up dropping off. So my answer would be 144, ne negative 144 degrees Celsius. Okay, but just follow along with those and like if it's Boyle's law, it's pretty easy to move those variables. But if it's Charles's law and it's a temperature number, you're gonna have a little more rearranging that you have to do to be able to solve it. So that's why I wanted to go through and give you one of these as an example. So gas laws, there's a dynamic study module on gas laws that'll help you in kind of like looking at theory aspects, like what happens when volume changes, what happens to temperature, what happens to volume if pressure changes occur. So there's some math in practicing that, but there's also a lot of kind of like trying to get you to think about them as well. The middle part of this chapter talks about the attractive forces that molecules that are not, they're not bonds, but we're talking about separate molecules 
what creates or causes some molecules to be solid at room temperature because they're so attracted to each other, to be liquid at room temperature where they want to be close but they flow past each other, or to actually be gases at room temperature because remember we said that gases basically have like no attraction. They're not attracted to other gas molecules. They behave as if they're all by themselves. And it's really these five. So there are five what they call intermolecular forces. So intermolecular, think of these are attractions between two molecules. And it really determines the state that a substance is in at room temperature versus 100 degrees Celsius versus minus 100 degrees Celsius. The reason why has to do with these attractive forces. So we'll just go through them from weakest to strongest. The first one is what they call London forces. So London forces are listed as the weakest. These forces are the only forces that you find in nonpolar molecules. Nonpolar molecules, remember, are molecules that have only carbon and hydrogen. So these tend to be long chains, of carbon, those organic molecules that we talked about, methane, ethane, propane, butane, remember just the chain, straight chains of carbon, no other atoms, just carbon and hydrogen. They have very little attraction for each other. In fact, like CH4, it's a gas at room temperature, it's methane, natural gas. But what they find when you're talking about carbon chains that are more than five and six carbons in size, they begin to display what they call London forces. Another way that they've named them is they've also been called dispersion forces. They were also studied by a scientist named Van der Waal, so they were called that for a while. They've kind of settled on London forces or dispersion forces as being the most common ones. And here's a way of thinking about London forces. London forces are extremely weak. As soon as London forces form, they like dis they go away. So they're not something that's constant. A way of thinking about it is if you have, and in this one, this is a heptane. So heptane has seven carbons. So you see like seven carbons in a chain. You see hydrogens above, hydrogens below, hyd one hydrogen on each end. So in this, normally, the electrons that form a single bond, remember it's a pair of electrons, and I told you that they like go back and forth, back and forth. So there are electrons going between carbon and hydrogen, carbon and hydrogen on all those lines. Occasionally, more of the electrons will be around the hydrogens than around the carbon. And so that you can see, maybe it'll let me blow this up. Maybe it won't. It did yesterday, there, let's see. So can you see in this one, sorry that it's not in like bright, but if you look at this top one, do you see how it looks like the shared electrons look like they're more around the H, okay? More around the hydrogens at the top compared to being more evenly distributed. So what that creates is more electrons above, which gives a very slight negative charge to the top of the molecule. So then that means the bottom of the molecule has less electrons, so it becomes a little positive. But as soon as this forms, it goes back. So this isn't like a permanent thing. It's almost like a temporary electron imbalance. When you have long chains of carbon, then this can play more of a role. So if you have greater than five carbons, you'll see that they'll start to have this slight attraction that those carbon atoms for have for each other. But methane is a gas at room temperature. Ethane with two carbons, gas at room temperature. Propane, the only way that you can make it a liquid is if you put it under pressure, like in a bottle, okay, like in a propane tank. If you release the pressure on a propane tank, you can hear the gas coming out. Propane would normally be a gas at room temperature. So little hydrocarbons, they don't have any attraction. They don't really have London forces even. You have to have bigger molecules to start to see this. So think about like gasoline. So gasoline is a liquid at room temperature. Those are eight, 10, 12 carbon chains. So they start to have some of this and as big as they are, that forms that liquid at room temperature. So these molecules can get closer together. They do evaporate pretty quickly. If you spill gasoline, it evaporates. 
Okay. So it doesn't hang out as a liquid unless it stays kind of in an enclosed space. So hydrocarbons, carbons and hydrogen molecules, London for forces are the only attractive force. I do kind of like their analogy. So they give the analogy of saran wrap or cling wrap, plastic wrap. So if you take plastic wrap and you tear it off, okay, the folding that automatically happens, how the flap of the end of the cling wrap like flips over on itself and then you have to straighten that one out then another one does you have to straighten that out it's really hard to get it to stay nice and flat and straight that's kind of what a london force is really weak you can straighten it out doesn't take a whole lot of effort and so it's almost like this what they say it's like a momentary imbalance in electrons creates this slight charge nature all right so then the next one so the next one is a permanent imbalance in electrons because this is what polar molecules do. So remember that on the periodic table, what you see, if you see one, nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, or chlorine. So remember we talked about this in chapter three, and I draw it like that because it's in the upper right corner on the periodic table, N, O, F, and C, L. If you see those, they are electronegative, which means that they pull electrons towards them. So remember when we talked, we said, well, if you have H and Cl and you have a bond that is formed between the two of them, the chlorine pulls the electrons over closer to it. They don't hang out with the hydrogen as much. This creates a negative sidedness and a positive sidedness to the molecule. That's a polar molecule. So I told you if you only see one nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, or chlorine in a small molecule, then you know it's going to be polar. So the, the, they say that this is a permanent imbalance. It's an imbalance in the sharing of electrons that creates a sidedness, slight positive, slight negative. The fancy term or the intermolecular force that they describe when they talk about something that's polar is they say that it has this dipole-dipole attraction. So a dipole just means that slight positive, slight negative. So there's like sidedness to the molecule and notice how these line up. So this, so this is like dimethyl ether. So it's an ether molecule. So the oxygen, just so that you can see what it looks like, the oxygen here, the CH3 sticking off. So that oxygen is going to pull the electrons closer to it, spending less time around the CH3s. That's why they have this side as being slightly positive. If I could draw it. And it's that funny little figure eight symbol that they use. Like this. So here's what it looks like, kind of like that, with either a positive or a negative to show this slight positive, slight negative. All it's saying is the electrons are not uniformly distributed and they stay that way. So it's a permanent imbalance in electrons. So you get this slight charge the, where the oxygen is, is going to be a slight negative. So notice how these molecules kind of line up. So the oxygens like to be near the CH3s, the CH3 near the oxygens because this slight positive and negative is kind of like a magnet. So it's going to create this slight imbalance. Polarity is much stronger than London forces, much stronger. So for example, CH4, remember that this is methane. This has London forces. This is a gas at room temperature. Methanol, CH3OH, the only difference is it's got an oxygen. So if it's got one oxygen and it's little, you know it's polar. So it's going to have this dipole interaction. This is methanol. This is a liquid at room temperature. So in like in lab, we actually use this to make that oil of wintergreen. You had to go get a certain volume of methanol, put it in your tube and heat it. So liquid at room temperature, even though it's not that much difference in size. Having that oxygen creates this imbalance, this slight charge, and now these molecules want to be close together. They want to stick together. They want to be close to each other. So that is going to greatly increase the melting point and boiling point in a molecule. So like acetone, another example, it's a ketone, has that single oxygen, and that's like nail polish remover. 
It's a liquid at room temperature. So having this attraction greatly increases the attraction that molecules for have for one another. Third one. So the third one is what's called hydrogen bonding. So hydrogen bonding is really a super strong polar molecule because if you have an oxygen and it has a hydrogen, and it doesn't matter if the other one's a hydrogen or the other one's some other kind of atom, if there's an oxygen or a nitrogen with a hydrogen attached, there will be an attraction that the one oxygen will have for another oxygen or nitrogen's hydrogen. So what you'll get is you'll get this attraction. And in fact, this hydrogen kind of ends up being shared between the two oxygens. So it sort of can even go back and forth. It's not a covalent bond. Hydrogen bonds are only about 10, 10% the strength of a covalent bond. But that attraction, it's more than just being polar. It pulls. It really helps to pull those two molecules together. This is a stronger attraction. And in fact, so I say like hydrogen bonding is only 10% the strength of a covalent bond. But oftentimes in a molecule, a, if you have a bunch of molecules that can hydrogen bond, they'll form thousands of hydrogen bonds, not just like two or three. So then it starts acting more like covalent linking. So that creates this more the stronger attraction than even what you see with just polar molecules. So you can see it and they do have that they say, well, it can be a nitrogen and an oxygen or a fluorine. I don't really worry about the fluorine. Why? Because we don't really have fluorine just floating around forming hydrogen bonds in your body, but you do with oxygen and you do with nitrogen. So those are ones that you're really going to see in living systems. Small molecules with the nitrogen or an oxygen that has a hydrogen attached can have hydrogen bonding. So it is only 10% as strong as a covalent bond, but But these molecules tend to form hundreds and thousands of hydrogen bonds. And that makes them significant. So in this, for hydrogen bonds, look for an oxygen or a nitrogen, not both, one or the other. And if one of those, I mean, you might have both, but as long as you have at least one, you're looking to see, does it have a hydrogen directly connected? So it's going to have to be an O with an H or an N with an H as part of the bonds to it. Right, so like OH, alcohol groups. So having those alcohol groups or NHs, like an amine or an amide, okay? So remember the nitrogen, if it has a hydrogen attached, those are the ones that you're going to have the ability to do hydrogen bonding. So water is really like the best example. If you look at this picture, you can see that there are five water molecules that are shown. So here's an H2O. Remember that it, they end up having that bent arrangement. Here's another one and another one. So here's five. So these do have that polarity. The oxygen's more negative, the hydrogens become more positive. But even stronger than that, there is this attraction that is formed between hydrogens of one water molecule and oxygens of other water molecules. So notice in this, 
this middle water molecule has the ability to form four hydrogen bonds. So that center H2O, two hydrogen bonds with the oxygen to nearby hydrogens, two hydrogen bonds of its hydrogens to lower oxygen molecules. So there's four hydrogen bonds and that's just five molecules of water. So when you have a cup of water, you're talking about millions, even billions of hydrogen bonds that are all interacting and participating. And that is the reason why water has the characteristics that it has. Because water can form four hydrogen bonds per one molecule. So you get 10, now you, it's acting like they're covalently linked. And then they get more and more and thousands of them to create that super strong attraction. So water really needs to kind of be discussed because water has special characteristics. Water makes up two thirds of your body. And if you were made of any other molecule as a solvent, we would not be able to exist the way that we do. It is really the hydrogen bonding that occurs in water molecules that allow for this participation. So I've got five water molecules sort of drawn on that top left. And if you see the little red dashes, the dashes between oxygens and nearby hydrogens, that's hydrogen bonding. So you can see that that center water molecule has four of them that are formed and linked together. You can see how they sort of pull each other in. Because of hydrogen bonding, one of the characteristics of water is that it has a very high melting point and boiling point. So water melts at zero degrees Celsius and boils at 100 degrees Celsius. Methane, which is almost exactly the same molecular weight, the same size, it's already a gas before room temperature. Whereas this exists as a liquid at room temperature and you really have to boil it, heat putting a lot of energy in to break the hydrogen bonds. That is the reason why water boils at such a high temperature compared to its size. Most small molecules are gases at room temperature. They're just small enough that they don't have that attraction, but water does. But the other thing that water, having all these hydrogen bonds, it absorbs and releases a lot of heat energy before it changes temperature. So even now, if you have a pool, even now, even though it's been like 50 degrees at night, your pool temperature is probably still in the 70s. And that is because it's a large volume of water and it's gonna release heat energy during those cool evenings, and it, but it's not gonna change temperature like right away, like other molecules would. It's just gonna slowly cool off. Same thing happens when you go get in your pool in like the beginning of May, you're like, whoo! Okay, yeah, it's 85 degrees out and it's really hot, but you put your foot in and you're like, nope, it's way too cold. It takes a long time for all that water to heat up. So water heats and cools slowly because of all those hydrogen bonds. To heat water up, you gotta break hydrogen bonds. To cool water down, you gotta form more hydrogen bonds. And that's the reason that water changes temperature relatively slowly. It has what they call a high specific heat. That's good for us because that means that your temperature doesn't change very quickly. So even if you get sick and you run a fever, your temperature doesn't go from 98.6 to 110. Your temperature goes up by these small increments. And by the time it's 100, you feel terrible, okay? But it hasn't changed all that much compared to what other molecules would. So this is really important in, to help us maintain a consistent, a constant body temperature. The ability of water to form hydrogen bonds helps to keep the temperature relatively constant. Third thing, third thing is what they call cohesiveness. And so I've got a couple of examples. So here is, this is a raindrop. So in a raindrop, you have millions of hydrogen bonds. So water molecules near each other have all of this attraction. This is the reason why water type likes to stick together. Water likes to kind of form these droplets if you've watched like raindrops on the window, so as raindrops hit the window, they're real small, but eventually they'll like start to fall down. And when they meet another water droplets, they come together. So they don't stay separated. They begin to collect and collect and collect until they get a big enough drop 
that they actually run down, that is because of that cohesiveness. All those hydrogen bonds make the water droplets want to stick together. So the little picture next to it, which looks ridiculous, but the little picture, this is my water bug. And so if you've ever seen a water bug sitting on top of the surface of water, like they have their little arms and legs all spread out. And if you look at the arms and legs, they actually make a little dimple on the surface of the water, but they don't fall through. They can be held up because of hydrogen bonds. So there's hydrogen bonds on the surface of water. Then there's hydrogen bonds from the water molecules below the surface water molecules. And that actually creates a semi-solid layer on the surface. And it's strong enough so that water bugs can sit there. It's the whole reason you can float in water is you are actually supported by hydrogen bonds so that you can float on the top of the water. Has anybody ever done a belly flop? The reason the belly flop hurts is because you actually break all those hydrogen bonds when you hit the surface of the water like flat. Water bugs sitting there, if you've ever water skied or seen people water ski, it looks like they're just skipping right across the surface of the water. And the reason is, is they're moving fast enough that they don't break the hydrogen bonds. But then if you see them wipe out, they like spin and bounce across the surface like a rock. And then finally they slow down enough so that they sink in because that's the lowest broke the speed. Once their speed drops, it allows them to break those hydrogen bonds and drop in. So to show you surface tension, so surface tension, that's that strength. I brought some beakers that just have water in them. Well, not that one. Don't look at that one yet. Okay. But looking at the other ones. And so on, if you've got one, so I put some out. And if you don't have one on your lap bench, if you flip around and look at the person behind you, you know, I know that there's, there's on either other side type of thing. Okay. So what I've got is, these are just paper clips. So this is a little paper clip. So this little paper clip has been kind of unfolded. So it's going to be our water bug. Okay. What I want you to do, so this one is like a little paper clip holder. So you want to take your paper clip and lay it on top of the little paper clip holder. And then I want you to lower it slowly down onto the surface of the beaker so that it floats. Okay. So right now, so the, the paper clip is now sitting on top. So you try it. Mm -hmm. Give it a couple of tries. You guys got one back there. Yep. Nice and slowly lower it down in. It should sit right on top. And if you look at it, you can actually, once you get it to do that, you can actually see that it looks like it's creating a little bit of a dimple on the surface. No, try it again. Did you get it quirk? Better, you may have to dry it off. Mm -hmm, you gotta fish it out with that. Mm -hmm, fish it out with the little hook. Just work. Mm -hmm. Lay it down, dry it off, set it on the hook, just slowly lower it down. I'm like this one's still floating. So it hasn't dropped through. Mm -hmm. Just like that. Nice and slow and steady. Just lower it down into the water. Yep, yours is pulled out. Good. Go down. Keep going. Can you get the handle out without touching and not there you go? Mm -hmm. So if you look at it, can you see that it creates almost like a, a, a little bit of a, a bend on the surface where the water is? Mm -hmm. So see how it's floating? See how you can, you can create, it almost is like, you can see like the outline of how it's laying on top of that water. It creates like a little bit of a bend. Did you get it? Let me see this. This. There was anything on this side. Right? Straight. All right. Oh, you hit it. <laughs> it's almost there. You guys floating? Good. Okay, so that's what a water bug does. So a water bug doesn't weigh much more than the paper clip, but a water bug spreads its little arms and legs out so that it's on different part points of those hydrogen bonds. If I had taken the paper clip and not spread it out, it wouldn't have done that. It wouldn't float well, but spreading the paper clip out gives it a little more surface area and helps it to hold. They call this surface tension. 
So surface tension is this attraction that water molecules have on the surface of any kind of liquid. It's the reason you can water ski. It's the reason you can float. This attraction of water molecules is an issue for preemies. So premature infants, so these are infants that are born before 32 weeks, normal gestation periods, about 40 weeks. So if they're more than six to eight weeks early, the last system to develop are their lungs, okay? So in fetal development, the lungs are one of the last systems to develop. And so one, these babies are really little. So these are those babies that are like two pounds, three pounds. So they're like, you know, they're little, itty bitty, look like little chickens. Okay, so what happens when they're born, when a normal full-term infant is born, the first time they take their breath, they inflate the air sacs of the lungs, which are this alveoli, so this is where the air goes into to allow for diffusion. There is, there are cells that line the air sacs that make what's called surfactant. And surfactant is kind of like soap. It is a natural chemical that is made, and what it does is it reduces the surface tension of water. So I can show you this. You won't be able to do this again. So here's soap. I put just the smallest possible drop. You see the change? Okay. So you put just I put this the tiniest drop I could. What that does, soap breaks up this attraction. Soap causes these water molecules to pull apart, to not have so many hydrogen bonds. And so I put that tiny drop on in this, in the, if you did this to the water bug, <laughs> it would end up going in, okay? It wouldn't have that surface tension. So this is the problem with preemies that don't have this surfactant. When they inhale, they open up the air sacs of the lungs, but when they exhale, there's no surfactant, so the lungs completely close again. So every time they take a breath, they have to open the air sacs of the lungs. When they exhale, they completely close. And so over time, they go into what's called respiratory distress, and it's really because their diaphragm, their little external intercostals are very small and not very strong. So they can actually get to the point of fatigue, their muscles will get so tired from just trying to breathe that they won't be able to breathe by themselves anymore. So 20 years ago, this could actually mean that that infant didn't survive if they were born 32 weeks or earlier, more than um, seven months or so. If they were born prior to that, odds are they wouldn't survive. And it really, a lot of it had to do with the fact that their lungs just weren't developed enough. So understanding about surfactant and how it acts like this soap to break that surface tension, they developed a, a drug. It's actually like a little spray. So this little teeny tiny baby, they like put a little, they ventilate them. So they put a tube down their throat so that they can push air into the lungs and they spray surfactant. And surfactant literally looks like a can of WD-40, right? So you know WD-40 has a long straw. So that's what it is. So it's got in this little, this little spray with this long straw, they put it down into the airways, give them a few shots of artificial surfactant. And now when they exhale, the lungs will deflate, but they won't completely close. So now that means that baby doesn't have to work as hard to open them up because they're not completely closing with every exhale. So then they have less respiratory distress. So they're getting better oxygen. They do sometimes have to keep them on a ventilator for a while. They give them a lot of steroids because steroids help to speed up the maturation of their lungs. And that once they start making surfactant on their own, they like wean them off. And that way, that's why it, like now a lot of babies, a lot of these two and three pound babies, like survive with very little health complications later in life because of this understanding and then being able to treat this lack of surfactant. So that's the third thing. So water is a high melting and boiling point, absorbs heat, changes temperature very slowly, likes to cling together. Four, the last one, it is the universal solvent. Okay, so that is probably the, like one of the most common things that you've heard said in any kind of like life science class. Water is the universal solvent because water is polar and it can hydrogen bond. So water likes to mix with things that are polar. 
Water likes to mix with things that are ionic as well, because anything with the charge, water can mix with. So that means like we've talked about carbohydrates. So water mixes with sugars. So it mixes with sucrose, glucose, fructose. So all those little sugars, very polar, lots of alcohol groups on those sugars, they can mix with water. Salts, sodium chloride. Water is a really good solvent for most salts because sodium chloride has a charge. Positive sodium ions, negative chloride ions, water is attracted to that. The one we have talked about that water doesn't like to mix with, that's not going to mix with, are lipids. Lipids are those fats and oils because remember that they're long chains of carbon and that creates that nonpolar molecule. Those are the ones that are the issue in terms of getting them to mix and stay mixed. But otherwise, water works very well for most of the molecules that we have in the body. Fourth one, so we got five, right? So hydrogen bonding was third, and water is a good example of hydrogen bonding. Fourth one is really what water does when you put it with any kind of salt. So in looking at this, so water, if it comes upon a NaCl, so here's sodium, and remember, sodium is positively charged. There's the chlorine. The chloride ion is negatively charged. But then water has this slight charge as well. So remember, this side's slightly negative, this side slightly positive, slightly positive around the hydrogens. And so the chloride being negative is going to be attracted to the hydrogens of the water molecule. The sodium being positive is going to be attracted to the slight negative sidedness that the oxygen has. And this can actually allow the sodium and the chlorine to separate. So they can interact with the water instead of remaining together. This is why when you put salt in water and stir it up, it completely dissolves and you don't see it anymore. You can actually break apart those ionic compounds into their individual ions because they can interact with water. So anytime you see any kind of a salt, in water, and remember a salt, an ionic compound is going to be something with a metal and a non-metal. So on your periodic table, remember the zigzag line. So anything with a metal and a non-metal plus, and it says in water, then you know it's what they call ion dipole. So this is the fact that ionic compounds can mix into water because of this attraction. It allows things like sodium to exist in the body. They talk about your sodium levels. They talk about your potassium levels, tell you that your magnesium is too low, that your calcium is too low, right? But when they talk about those, they don't talk about it as a whole. They talk about the individual ions because in solution, these ions are separated. Yeah, there's still chloride ions floating around in there, but they're not connected. So that's the trick for recognizing this. Just look for some kind of salt in water. The fifth one, the highest. The highest attraction is salts as a whole. Salt molecules like to form crystals, right? So if you look at table salt, so if you like knock some table salt onto the counter and you look at it real close, you can actually see that it's kind of got, looks like it's got little sides to it, a very regular crystalline shape. The whole reason that they form a crystal is because of the way that the ions line up. So if you look at this, this is a, a block in a salt crystal. Everywhere there's a chlorine, there's a sodium around it. Everywhere there's a sodium, it's surrounded by chlorines. So they form this kind of lattice work. They get packed in super tight together. Salts, like sodium chloride, NaCl, it has a melting point of about 2,500 degrees Celsius. The reason it has such a high melting point, why it exists as a solid, is because it likes to form these crystals. So forming these crystals, very stable arrangement, those ions very strongly attracted, We will talk about some things that are where you have these ions formed that create this attraction. Sometimes they call them salt bridges.
because it's where you have a positively charged thing and a negatively charged thing that are attracted. Proteins do this. But this is really the strongest attraction. Like you can think of this as kind of almost strong magnets, okay? Whereas the other ones are much more weak when you get this slight positive and negative. That's not the same as this. These are ions, so these have a direct charge. Positives are attracted to negative. So if you see a molecule, so if I give you examples and I say, what is the strongest intermolecular force in this molecule? Ways that you can tell, and these ones I've got in order. So the first one, this is London forces because nothing but carbon and hydrogen. So you see that? Nothing but carbon and hydrogen. This is a nonpolar molecule. No nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, or chlorine, right? only carbon and hydrogen, this is only going to have London forces. They're the weakest of the forces. Nonpolar molecules really don't care about each other very much. <laughs> They're like, meh. <laughs> just because they just don't have any slight positive and negative other than those very temporary London forces. Second one, when you look at the second one, you're like, oh, carbons and hydrogen, but wait, there's an oxygen. If you see nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, chlorine, okay? And none of them have a hydrogen. If there's no hydrogens directly on them, directly connected, then this, and it's a small, it typically has to be a small molecule, but the examples I'll give you will pretty much be small. This is a polar molecule. Right, so remember when talking about like covalent molecules, polar versus nonpolar, I said, okay, look to see, is there a nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, or chlorine? If there's only one, polar, move on, <laughs> okay? If there's only one of those and there's no hydrogen on the nitrogen or the oxygen, then you know it's polar and that, that intermolecular force is called dipole, dipole. So this third one is also polar, but if you see a nitrogen or an oxygen and it's got a hydrogen attached. So notice if you see OH or if you see an NH, those can hydrogen bond. So that's a stronger attraction than just being polar. Third one, the way you tell, or sorry, fourth one. The fourth one, you can tell because it's some kind of salt in water, okay? So you'll have the term in water. So that means that I have this ionic compound in water And that's ion dipole. Those salts interact with water better than water interacts with other water molecules. So that salt, because of those charged natures of the ions, creates this strong attraction. And then the last one. So the last one, Fe2O3. If you see this molecule, you see Fe, you see that it's to the left of the zigzag line. You see oxygen, you see it's to the right of the zigzag line. Then you know that this is just a salt, right? So this is an ionic compound. So remember, you'll look for, if you see a metal, then a nonmetal. That that's the strongest most stable interaction between these molecules, creates solids at room temperature with very high melting points. Those are ionic interactions. Okay, so everybody got those. So you've got kind of like the things to look for. So on this next slide, they're kind of mixed up. So you look at the first one. So look at this first one. So you look at the atoms that are in this molecule if it's nothing but carbon and hydrogen, it's London force. 
If you see a nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, or chlorine with no hydrogens attached to them, then you know that that is dipole-dipole. If you see a nitrogen or an oxygen with a hydrogen, then you know it's hydrogen bonding. If you see a salt in water, it's ion dipole. And if it's just a salt listed, then you know it's ionic. So what's this first one? It is? Mm -hmm. It's dipole-dipole. So here, there, I said if you have a nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, or chlorine, there's the electronegative. All right, so N, O, F, or C, L creates this polar molecule, and polar molecules, this side becomes sort of negative, down here would become kind of positive. I just can't draw my eights today. I kind of like that. Okay, so I got a permanent polarity, dipole, dipole. What is the second one? London forces, yeah, good. So when you look, do you see nothing but carbon and hydrogen? Nothing but carbon and hydrogen, C and H only, London forces. Doesn't matter how big it is or how small, if there's just C and H, nothing but carbons and hydrogen, then it's gonna be a nonpolar molecule, share their electrons equally. London forces are the strongest attraction. All right, third one. Al2O3, it's ionic. Ionic because aluminum is a metal. Remember, to the left is a zigzag line. So this is an ionic compound. This is a metal, non-metal. So this is ionic. CH3OH, hydrogen bonding. Mm -hmm. An oxygen with a hydrogen attached to it. This is hydrogen bonding. And then the last one, Na2SO4 in water. Mm -hmm. This one's ion dipole. Because Na2SO4, this is a salt. When you put a salt in water, they separate into ions and float about. Quite happy. Stay dissolved, don't separate. Salt water, you could have salt water for years. Salt and water mixed together, they're never going to separate. The sodium ions are perfectly fine floating around with the chloride, with the water molecules. Same thing for the chloride. Okay, so these are the forces, and those are the kinds of things that you look for. So next time, we'll do this one. So in the in-between, one, two, three, four, five, there's five more examples. So this one's in the next slide. I'm not going to do this one now. Take, take time and kind of look at it to see if you can figure out what is the strongest intermolecular force with those? So we're not going to talk so much about vapor pressure and melting and boiling points because we've really talked about like the major ones, but I will show you this one. So the reason we talk about this is to really, one, bring up hydrogen bonding because hydrogen bonding is probably the most important of all of the intermolecular forces that we just talked about. Hydrogen bonding explains a lot about structures. Look, it stayed and it's in color. <laughs> so what is this? What is this structure? This is a molecule of DNA, okay? So you've probably seen it, the double-stranded helix, right? So you see those two strands that look like they twist. You see there's an A and a T, there's a C and a G, and then you see those dots. So those dots between are hydrogen bonds. So if you look at this one down at the bottom, so this is how guanine and cytosine, guanine is G, cytosine is C. So there's the chemical structure on the left is a guanine, on the right is a cytosine. Do you see the dot, dot, dots? So between the oxygen of the guanine, oh, I lost it. The oxygen of the guanine and, see this is what's like so irritating. It's hard to see it now. <laughs> makes me makes me so happy to have technology. You can kind of see it, okay? Above the, the little white area, you can see one of them. And if you look close, you can actually see there's three. So there are three hydrogen bonds between a G and a C pair. So remember I said, well, hydrogen bonds aren't that strong, 10% of a covalent bond. But now, now knowing, thinking, okay, how many little dot, dot, dots do you see looking down the strand? Every AT has two, 
Every GC has three. So now you start to have lots of them. That is the reason why, even though it's two strands, those strands stick together. You can peel them apart when you have to do protein synthesis. And when, they're, when you let go, they're going to snap right back because that hydrogen bonding makes the molecule more stable. This way, it gets twisted easily. It tends to break less, get into knots less, have more damage less by being that double strand. So we'll talk more when we talk about DNA, we'll talk about hydrogen bonding. And I will tell you another topic we're gonna get into in chapter 10, proteins. Proteins being the last of the nutrient groups. Proteins are very reliant on intermolecular forces to create their shape, whether they fold into helixes or if they end up with a big globular enzyme shape, that shape is all because of those intermolecular forces that we've been talking about. Things like hydrogen bonding or ionic interactions, even London forces, which create a different attraction. When they talk about London forces and about hydro and about nonpolar molecules, they're talking about molecules that they refer to as hydrophobic. So the term phobia is a what? Fear, right? You're scared of snakes, then you have a phobia for snakes, okay? Arachnophobia, fear of spiders. Phobic, think of fearing. Things that are hydrophobic are water fearing. So these are going to be your nonpolar molecules, right? Your fats, your oils, your waxes. You put these things in water, separate right out. Water doesn't want to interact with the lipids, doesn't like the lipids. They don't have the same intermolecular forces. They only have London forces. So water doesn't have time for that, okay? There's no attraction with those. Hydrophilic, though, so phobic is fearing, philic is loving. So hydrophilic is a term that they use to describe things that are water loving. So what kind of molecules would these be? Salts, ionic compounds, right? So salts like to mix with water, like to separate into their ions and float about. What else is water loving? Sugars, anything that's polar. Polar molecules like sugars. Ones that we have lots of alcohol groups so they can interact with water molecules. Things that are polar, things that are salts, Things that are ionic, they're going to be hydrophilic. Things that are hydrophobic, they're not going to mix with water. They're those nonpolar molecules. And we kind of mentioned this, the golden, the golden rule of solubility, like dissolves like. So polar things mix with polar things. Hydrophilic things mix with hydrophilic things. So that's why salts and water can mix, because they're both hydrophilic. Things that are hydrophobic can mix together, so like fats and oils. You can mix fats and oils together. So you can like melt butter in a pan, add olive oil, stir it up, and it's mixed. It'll look uniform. So they mix together. But if I take something hydrophilic and something hydrophobic, they're going to want to separate out. That's why oil and water separate because they do not have the same intermolecular forces and they're not going to be able to interact and they'll separate into a heterogeneous mixture. So you'll be able to see layers or parts. So what about molecules that are amphipathic? Amphi. Amphi means both. So like a frog is an amphibian. What does that mean? It can live on land and on water, okay? So amphibians can do both. They can hang out in the water all the time. They can also hop up onto land. Amphipathic means that it's got parts that are hydrophilic and parts that are hydrophobic. So it is going to have a hydrophilic region and a hydrophobic region. So it's got both. So that is where this term amphipathic came from. It's going to have polar charged area and then a non-polar neutral area. So a good example of this, the first one, soap. So we made soap in lab. So soap is made from long chains of carbon, but on the end of that chain is a charged group 
that also contain some electronegative atoms. So in this one, there's two oxygens. So you know oxygens are part of the electronegative group, but it's also charged. If there was just oxygens, it really wouldn't be enough to have an effect, but the fact that it's also got that one oxygen has a negative charge, now it's got ionic interactions. And remember, ionic is the strongest of all of the intermolecular forces. So that's why that end of the soap molecule, they say that it is a hydrophilic, they call it a hydrophilic head, because it's got polar nature and charged so that whole side has wants to interact with water. But then if you look, all those carbons, so in that one, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17 carbons are those little black circles going in a zigzag line all the way down. Nothing but carbons and hydrogen. So if you like ignore the head and you look at the rest of the molecule, do you see that all of this, this is the nonpolar hydrophobic tail. Hydrophobic, doesn't want to interact with water, has that nonpolar nature, and since it's so long, they said it looks like a tail. Okay? Membranes do the same thing, except that there's going to have two tails. So, if you take a soap molecule and you put it in water, only one part of the soap molecule wants to interact with water. Which side, the head or the tail? The head, right? Because the head's hydrophilic. The head has that charged electronegative oxygen in there. So as soon as you take a soap collection of soap molecules and drop them in water, this is what forms. So remember that these heads are hydrophilic. The tails are hydrophobic. So the tails do not want to interact with the water. So the way that they can arrange themselves is you get these spheres, these balls that are formed in the water. The exterior, the surface of the ball, is the hydrophilic heads. And then tucked into the center of the ball are the hydrophobic tails. So you end up with this sort of hydrophilic outside. And now this can stay and interact with water can stay dissolved in water so it doesn't separate out. But the interior now is where those nonpolar tails can more or less like hide from the water molecules. They call this a micelle. So a micelle is just a sphere that soap molecules make when you put them in water. They're automatically going to start to form this. Well, they don't form this like instantly. This takes a second or two. So in the whole premise of hand washing. So say that you're cooking, okay? So you're making cookies and you got all of this sugar on your hands because you're doing the sugar cookie thing, right? So you get sugar on your hands. How do you get the sugar off your hands? You just rinse them in water, right? Because sugar is polar. Sugar is hydrophilic. Sugar completely dissolves in water. So really all you gotta do is just stick your hands underneath running water, that'll dissolve the sugar. Any salt on your hands, that'll get dissolved away without any issue. But what if you got butter on your hands? <laughs> what if you got some grease on your hands? What happens if you stick your hands under water? You know your hands still feel greasy, right? That grease is hydrophobic. So the grease is not gonna dissolve in water. They do not have the same intermolecular forces. And this is where the requirements for soap come in. So hand washing. When you wash your hands, first, most important thing is what do you need? What do you put first? Water. You really should put water. You need water. My cells do not form without water. The whole premise of a my cell formed is because the tails don't want to interact with water. So if you put soap on your hands and no water, all you got is a bunch of soap molecules on your hands. They actually don't form this until the water is added because the water makes those tails go hee and try to get away. They want to then round up into the sphere. So one, you got to wet your hands. You need water, okay? So that is a requirement. Wet your hands first, then you add soap.
So in one little squirt from your soap dispenser, there's millions of soap molecules, millions of those little heads with the tail. As soon as they hit the water, they start to form micelles, tails tucking in, heads around the outside. And so this formation takes five to 10 seconds. This is why you mix your hands. So you mix the water and the soap And within five to 10 seconds, you will have millions of micelles. Doesn't happen instantly. And this is the whole premise. So as you're mixing your hands, your hands start bubbling, they start lathering. You might even notice that it starts to get kind of cloudy looking, the liquid as you're washing your hands. All of that cloudiness is because of all those micelles that are forming. So 10 seconds in, now we have the micelles. So now anything that is hydrophilic is really just gonna dissolve in the water, right? So any kind of salts, any kind of sugar, anything that is hydrophilic, that's just gonna end up around the outside. So like salts will be out here, cause they like, that's that ion dipole interaction. Salts will dissolve. Sugars. Baking soda if you're cooking, okay? Those things will just dissolve in the water as soon as the water hits your hands. But what about those hydrophobic? What about the greases, the waxes, the oils? they will get pulled off the surface of your hands and go where? Into the center of the micelles. So hydrophobic molecules grease, oil, fats will get pulled into the micelle because they're also hydrophobic. The interior of the micelle is hydrophobic, and so are these molecules, like dissolves like. So that'll allow those hydrophobic molecules to go So as a healthcare professional, the importance of hand washing comes into play here. Not only are greases, oils, waxes, fats, things that you've cooked with, you know, butter, oils, not only are those things hydrophobic, the surface of bacteria is hydrophobic. So bacteria have a coating on the outside and that actually helps bacteria stick to stuff. Okay, having a nonpolar hydrophobic surface means that when bacteria hit a solid surface, they're kind of sticky and that helps them to actually stick to surfaces. But problematic is that also helps them to stick to your skin. So if you just take your hands and put them under water, the bacteria that might be on the surface of your hands that you picked up and you're moving around, that bacteria is not gonna rinse off. It's gonna be just like the greases, the oils, the waxes. It's just so small, you can't feel it. So you're not like, oh, my hands are clean because they don't feel greasy. That's not gonna like cut it because these are microscopic. So bacteria, they have a hydrophobic surface. These little, there's your little E. coli, okay? But they have this like kind of oily, lipid-like surface. So they tend to cling to solid surfaces, they don't wash off easily in water. So using soap though, where do they go? That does lift them off of the skin surface. And so bacteria get pulled into the center of the micelles. How long does this take? They estimate it's about another five to 10 seconds. That is why they're saying like a 20 second hand wash is really the most effective way of making sure that you dislodge anything that is on the skin surface. So one, you gotta make the micelles. Two, you gotta give it a couple of seconds for those non-polar hydrophobic things to get pulled into the micelle. And then what do you do? 
you rinse. And when you rinse, all the micelles and everything inside of the micelles get rinsed away. So they don't stick to your skin, soap gets rinsed off, and that is going to help to remove any of those hydrophobic molecules much more effectively than if you just use water. Just more information about it. Sometimes they call soaps, emulsifiers, just because it has the ability to mix polar and nonpolar. It's just another term that they might use. Last one is we will talk about how fats and oils are used to be able to build membranes. So we'll talk about cells, phospholipids, the structures in a cell that help to form a barrier to control what goes in and out of the cell to kind of contain things. So that really finishes up chapter seven. So we should have no problem finishing this on Thursday. And then from there, we're just gonna go straight into chapter eight and start talking about different kinds of solutions, which uses a lot of this anyways. Make sure that you get the pre-lecture done for chapter eight by Thursday. So it should be set that it closes Thursday morning. So do make sure that you get that done.